This is CBC Here and Now. Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend kills himself near Bellevue Beach. Now a massive search is underway in the area. Newfoundland Power wants its money, no matter the personal cost. It felt terrible. I felt like I was a bill collector. I was being used as a bill collector by Newfoundland Power. They're rendering people homeless. There are hundreds here, but can heritage buildings be protected? Smaller communities um, have more uh, opportunity. Our quiet start to November continues into tomorrow, but there's some snow on the horizon for Labrador, rain pushing into Newfoundland. The full details are coming up. Our top story this evening, Philip Smith, Courtney Lake's abusive ex-boyfriend, is dead. His body was found near Bellevue Beach just over an hour outside St. John's early this morning. And since the discovery, the search and rescue rovers and police have been scouring the area. And that's where Here Now's Megan McCabe is live this evening. Megan, why are they searching there? The RNC is tight-lipped tonight, but all they'll say is that they're here along with the rovers conducting ground searches in connection to an ongoing investigation. But because we know that Smith was found dead here, this search is in connection with Courtney Lake's mis disappearance. Excuse me. Sources tell us that Philip Smith's body was discovered in the woods here early this morning. His family has a cabin just next door to where we're standing. The 25-year-old ex-boyfriend of Lake has had a very troubled several months. You'll remember Lake was the 24-year-old mother of a young son who was last seen on June 7th, with police calling her disappearance a homicide. But no one's been charged and her family is still looking for her body. Lake was last seen getting into this truck in Mount Pearl. Police did not say this was Smith's truck, but he had the same make and model, and it went, that truck was seized from his house back in June. And just yesterday, Smith was summoned to appear in court so that Lake's mom, Lisa Lake, can get a peace bond against him because the one that she had expired. Smith was convicted of assaulting Lake, sharing nude photos of her, and breaching orders to stay away from her and her mom multiple times. So this afternoon, Courtney Lake's family released this statement. Our condolences go out to the family of Philip Smith. We understand too well the heartbreak of sudden and tragic loss of a loved one. We acknowledge that no one has been charged in connection with Courtney's disappearance and murder. However, if Philip Smith was in fact involved, we hope he left information that will lead us to her. We continue to plead with those who have information pertinent to Courtney's disappearance and murder to please contact police or Crime Stoppers. Our family needs to honor Courtney with the dignity of a proper goodbye. Did Philip Smith leave a note? We don't know at this time, but clearly something has given police cause to start this massive search. And I, it, it may end when, they, when darkness comes, but they are saying they will continue tomorrow if necessary. So reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in Bellevue Beach. And thanks to Megan. We will go back live to Here and Now's Megan McCabe if there are any further developments. Well, imagine you let someone move into your home and to your surprise, your power was cut on their arrival. Well, CBC News has heard from seven people who say this was the case when Newfoundland Power came looking for money owed. Here and Now's Ryan Cook reports. It's been one week since the power was cut at Kate Underhill's boyfriend's home in Mount Pearl. The small victory today is that the power is back on, but there's a catch. Now I am moving out um, because according to Newfoundland Power, the only way for him to have gotten his power back was for me to move. Kate Underhill owes Newfoundland Power $1,500 from 2013. She is on a payment plan, but the electricity monopoly wants all its money before she or anyone else she's living with gets service. Newfoundland Power says it reserves the right to cancel people's service if they cohabitate with someone who owes money, but now Underhill doesn't know where to turn. They're rendering people homeless because now I've got the fear in me that no matter where I go, they're going to find out and then they're, my friends, my family's power could get cut and turn and then they're gonna go through all of this with me. And it just, it doesn't seem right. 
Megan Coombs knows the struggle. A single mother of a six-year-old girl, she tried to rent her basement apartment with heat and lights included last winter. When a tenant moved in, she said Newfoundland Power pressured her into giving out his name. Two months later, electricity was cut to her basement apartment just as she was heading out on vacation with her daughter. The power was never in the tenant's name. What happens if my pipes burst while I'm away? And Newfoundland Power said that would be the responsibility of the landlord. I said, well, I'm the landlord. I want to pay the bill. I want my heat and light restored. I don't want my pipes to burst. And they said, there's nothing we can do. Coombs was told she had to evict the man to get the power turned back on. 24 hours later, the tenant was gone. Since she rented the apartment with heat and lights, however, she does not believe there was grounds for eviction under the Residential Tenancies Act. It felt terrible. I felt like I was a bill collector. I was being used as a bill collector by Newfoundland Power in order to get him to pay you know, a bill that he had owed, gosh only knows how long ago it was. Coombs went two months without finding a new tenant, a loss of $1,700 in income. As for Underhill, she lost a fridge and freezer full of food. The company says it would only cut power during the application process, meaning a customer with an existing account need not worry about who moves in. Newfoundland Power says they haven't done anything wrong. They say they have a regulation that allows for this type of action. That still doesn't make things feel any better for Coombs or Underhill. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Susie so seems a little heavy-handed. Um, let's talk about the weather, something a little happier. First day of November, Ryan. Gorgeous. Oh, Is it going to last? I walked to work in short sleeves on the first day of November. It was fantastic. Huh? Yeah. And uh, short sleeves uh, for many, even this afternoon. Not so much in Lab West, where the temperature has been steady below zero all day. Uh, let's have a look at the board. If you are heading out over the next uh, couple of hours to take the dog for a walk, yeah, no need to really bundle up. I mean, temperatures, of course, will drop as the sun sets here across the island, but we're still into the double digits here at 6 o'clock for the eastern half of the island. A little bit cooler in those onshore winds along the west coast, and, of course, still below zero in Labrador City. Now, winds from the windy conditions we've had over the last couple of days starting to really ease off uh, still in the 20 to 30 kilometer per hour range along the northeast coast uh, 40 plus sustained along the coast of Labrador with some, some gusts to 60 but again that low is pulling away winds will continue to ease tonight and that will set the stage for a very frosty night across the big land tonight and even across inland parts of the island you can see where skies will be clear we will see temperatures in low-lying areas dip below freezing central Newfoundland minus two there St. John's Metro the Buren Peninsula again closer to the coast near three or four but inland areas near freezing so some scraping of the windshields tomorrow morning and how about Lab City could see the first minus double digit of the season across the province there tomorrow morning we are recovering quite nicely uh, for most of us tomorrow we'll talk more about this with your uh, uh, next couple of days forecast in just a few minutes Debbie thanks Ryan an engineering firm that inspected Bishop Field Elementary School says the ceilings in the building aren't safe. Last week, part of the ceiling collapsed in the gym. No one was hurt, but the school closed, and now students are attending class at the former school for the deaf. Here now is Carolyn Stokes reports. Perhaps to the surprise of no one, this 90-year-old building is in pretty rough shape. An inspection report released earlier this week points to big safety concerns, not just in the ceiling in the gym, but in the ceiling throughout the entire school. Engineering consulting firm Nova Consultants says water caused the partial collapse of the ceiling in the school's gym last week. The metal mesh that supports the ceiling was heavily corroded. Problem is, the rest of the school has ceilings that were constructed in the same way. That means what happened in the gym could happen anywhere, anytime. It's likely the 90-year-old brick exterior has many leaks allowing water to cause more unseen damage. Samples were taken from classroom ceilings and the report says one of those samples disintegrated into dust. The report shows photo after photo of ceiling cracks all over the school. It recommends removing all the plaster ceilings and calls for a more thorough inspection of the building. All of that takes time. Last week, the English school district said the plan was to have students back at Bishop Field after Christmas. No one was available for an interview today.
There are still a lot of questions about the future of Bishop Field, but one thing is for sure, the parents and teachers and students deeply love this school. And the ones I spoke to are still very optimistic that all of this can be repaired and that the school will eventually reopen. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Mayors and community leaders from across the province attended the Premier's Forum on Local Government in Cornerbrook today. The four-hour session focused on infrastructure, money, and a pilot project for regionalization and shared services. The government is seeking suggestions on developing a regional plan by 2019. These forums are important if you go back and reflect on you know what the outcomes of last year's. It really informs some of the very political decisions that you saw within the budget. As an example, our multi-year funding around infrastructure, of course, was an example of that. And I anticipate today to be a very good, engaging and challenging forum as well. Well, the deadline to be out is less than two weeks away. Permanent residents of Williams Harbor have until the 10th of November before the power is scheduled to be shut off in the community. Residents voted last year to resettle. In return for every household is supposed to get up to $270,000 to find somewhere else to live. But as here now's Jacob Barker reports, it was not an easy decision. You've got to get up early to catch dinner in Williams Harbor. The fishing community has relied on what lies beneath the water to live for generations. The summers are good, warm days, steady work and a paycheck is all someone here could ask for. The moratorium on the cod fishery was the beginning of the end for this small settlement on an isolated island. Well, I was born there, I got baptized there, got confirmed there, and I got married there. <laughs> so, this whole town is a, <laughs> been a lot for me here, right? It isn't official, but some call George Russell the mayor of Williams Harbor. His roots run deep here. Well, this is the old community father, and they lived there for hundreds of years here in Williams Harbor, right? Way down through the years, grandfather. They always lived Williams Harbor was the spot, right? Up on a hill, the community's original power source, now a relic. George remembers when electricity first came to Williams Harbor. You had to stay in one place all year round. So they figured this was a good spot here because it was uh, close to the fishing ground. Boy, lo and behold, we stayed there. The first year, taught me it was all gonna freeze. Put a glass of water on the table and, and it, next morning we froze solid. By mid-November, the community will go dark, the power will shut down, the ferry will stop running, everyone will be gone. We used to have a lot of stuff one time, but we don't have so much now because no people, no, not any people here, right? The shelves are still somewhat stocked at the only store in town. Well, when we get the food, they come in in the winter. That'd be fun because everybody in the community would be here. Before he get in through the door, everybody would be out to get some fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff. Hey, oh, what a going on. We wouldn't have it unpacked or anything. <laughs> if you want to buy something, you can call Rosalind Russell or her husband Freeman at home or just knock, they live right next door. If I didn't have a store, well, I wouldn't see so many people because I see, you know, but half is in the harbor every day. If I didn't have a store, I probably wouldn't see them. Oh. Rosalind doesn't know yet what the compensation will be for commercial businesses. Right now, she's thinking about the move. Well, I guess you only just got to take what you really need. You're not gonna take what you want to take. Uncertain about how things will be once they're out and not just for her. But your home is always dear to come back to. You've been living in here now like 40, 50 years. And everything, you, everything you've done in your lifetime is all, is all here. You know, you raise your family here. Like my boys comes back and it, it, all the time. And every Christmas we all get together. But now, uh, not going to be same, not going to be home for them anymore. Nobody says it was an easy decision to vote to relocate from Williams Harbor. But for the province, it made financial sense. Resettling the community will cost the provincial government about $4 million, but it says it will cost millions more than that to keep the community powered and the ferry running for the next 20 years. For the people who are leaving, it isn't just dollars and cents. Come on, baby. Here. Carl Larkham built his house about 25 years ago. Saw it every, every inch of lumber and that myself. In a few short weeks, he's making his move. What's it like leaving this house behind that you built here? Oh my God, I, I don't know. I just heard, I just heard a little bit of taking that about, but I can't. <laughs> I had to leave this world, but that's it, this world. 
If they're going to pay for it, they pay for it. Well, that's a deal on it, then I don't know. <laughs> Inside, empty walls where pictures once hung, but Carl's leaving much of his stuff behind. He plans to come back in the summers. If you love those heavens, you can run anywhere. Carl fought cancer a few years back. He still has to visit the hospital every three months. They can put the hospital all the time, too. Cold winters and cut off from medical services, two big reasons the aging community decided to vote the way it did. A lot of hard winters there and everything else. When I was younger, I didn't mind it, see? I didn't see this world. When he gets older, and I said, every day, but you don't see him no older, but I couldn't fix up any of that thing. I love the place anyway. And I don't know. I still love it. <laughs> long as you're happy is the main thing I say about it. And though when NL Hydro shuts off the power, the provincial government will deem it an evacuated community, the history and the memories people made here will live on on this shore in Williams Harbor, a place they will always call home. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Williams Harbor. Coming up, we'll explain why, why these pictures are causing a stir within this province.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, a group representing racially visible people is jumping into the fray over Hall Halloween costumes worn by a local law enforcement group Saturday night. They say they're disgusted by what some members of the law enforcement torch run group wore, including some in blackface. The pictures were posted to the group's Facebook page, but were taken down after complaints about what some felt was the inappropriateness of the costumes. Chris Lansdell is the director for racially visible members of the Public Service Alliance of Canada. So Chris, what do you think when you see these pictures? So when I, when I see this, the first thing I think is this is a completely unacceptable racist act. Uh, it's important to point out the act is racist. I'm not calling people racist. This, uh, this is a, a, an attempt to make a caricature, a stereotype out of African heritage. Anybody of African descent who looks at this doesn't see something that reminds them of their homeland. They see something that's meant to mock it, make fun of it, coming from a position of privilege. And it's not something that I would expect in today's environment from anyone, let alone a group of people working in law enforcement. This offends you personally. You feel it's an attack on your heritage? It, I mean, that's, that's the only way I can really look at this. You know, when you have a group of people dressing up in blackface with fake tribal items, emblems, shields, spears, how else am I going to look at that as a person who does have African ancestors, who, do, who has spent time reading into my background and finding out where this comes from? This isn't coming from a place of respect. This is coming from a place of, well, this is going to be a laugh. Hmm. Uh, you know, the, the torture on group says they were just raising some money for Special Olympics, that uh, it wasn't their intent to offend. Uh, why isn't that good enough for you? So intent only goes so far. If they intended to offend, we'd be having a completely different conversation. And I think a lot of people would be even more upset than we are. The point is, especially from law enforcement, they should know this. If I don't intend to speed, but I'm breaking the speed limit, I'm still getting a ticket. If you don't intend to offend someone and you do offend them, then something needs to be done about that. And to be clear, I'm not saying that some of these people need to lose their jobs, but there's definitely a lack of sensitivity, a lack of empathy, a lack of education. Why do you think they are so tone deaf to uh, your point of view and others who have been upset about this? It's very easy uh, as a member of a majority group to say, oh, well, this isn't going to offend anyone because you don't come from a position of ever having been offended by stuff like this. You've never had to look at this in any other light than we're having fun. But the important thing to remember is there are people out there for whom this is something that is a very real part of their history. And you can't just take that and throw it around willy nilly. If you want to respect people and show cultural diversity, do some research, find people that you respect, who are people of color, indigenous people, do some research and dress as them. Don't use blackface. Don't pretend that you're representing a tribe. Do it respectfully. Chris, a lot of people grew up dressing like this at Halloween. They don't see the uh, objection to it. They might say, oh, you're just being politically correct. I mean, how do you get your message through? So it's important to remember, with one thing politically correct, it has the word correct in it. That should tell you something. It's what we should be doing. The other one I hear a lot is you're being oversensitive. And I don't think that's accurate. I think what we're being right now is the correct amount of sensitive. And before, we were not sensitive enough. There used to be the environment that you could put anything on TV and it would fly. You only have to look at things like All in the Family. That would never fly today because people have become more aware of other people's feelings. And minority groups are now more empowered to speak up and say, hey, this is wrong. Just because it doesn't offend you, and that means anyone out there, whether you're a person of color or not, doesn't mean that it's not offensive. And the fact that it does offend some people means that somebody needs to step back and say, hey, we're sorry, that's not what we meant, we'll do better next time. So Chris, what more could the tour group do that would satisfy you? So it's two things. We'd like to see diversity and sensitivity training for the people involved, and also just apologize. Say to people of color and indigenous people, this isn't good enough, we won't happen. it won't happen again, we're sorry. Chris Lansdell, thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. A lot to think about there. Yeah, absolutely, and I'd like to ask that question because I think of some of the things that I dressed up with my brothers that with today, no way. So things mm -hmm. have changed, but it's a good, a good reminder of yeah, things, right? For sure. Yeah.
Well, Halloween is getting a second life here in Bannerman Park. Coming up, I'll tell you why pumpkins are lighting up the loop. This weather update is brought to you by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. What a spectacular picture sent to us by Paul West. Yeah, it's pretty grippy. Grippy? Grippy. <laughs> Grips your eyeballs. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> it is. Ryan, what is it? Uh, night, beautiful sunset pic taken in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And uh, Paul posted that to my Facebook page a couple days ago. Thanks, Paul. Oh, gorgeous. The sky's ablaze. It's beautiful. Actually, we had a ton of pictures taken uh, that night and posted on my Facebook page, so you can check them all out there. Sounds good. So, what's... Uh... What's on your menu for right now? Uh, well, we've got, uh, speaking of Labrador, we've got another picture to show you. And this one is uh, a little different than that. Note the reds and oranges there. This yeah. one's a little more white. Okay, <laughs> I think I know where we're going. Yeah, well, Western Labrador today, high below zero all day. And uh, a little bit of snow on the ground to Ooh. add uh, uh, just to the festive feeling there. Uh, let's have a look over at our weather wall here. And again, Sheldon Tuck uh, posted this picture today. 
not only the snow, but the salt truck, uh, sand truck, I'm assuming, I guess, there uh, in Happy Valley or in uh, Labrador City, Wabash. And this is actually at the Wabash Airport. And you can see there that's really, really uh, looking a lot like winter, as, as Sheldon mentioned. Special weather statements in effect right across the Big Lend, thanks to this next weather system that's moving in. And it will be bringing, yes, more in the way of snow. Uh, cool, cool in Labrador City today, but again, that southerly flow was helping uh, Newfoundland's temperatures to be above average for this time of year as we start November. A little bit more towards the seasonal mark tomorrow as we get into more of a westerly flow as this area of high pressure moves overhead. This is our weather maker over the next couple of days that's in the Great Lakes now. It's going to be moving in uh, as we roll through tomorrow night. As I mentioned earlier, cool temps tonight will drop to near the or even a little below the freezing mark for inland areas of the Avalon through central Newfoundland towards the west coast, but around the coast, temperatures likely uh, just above freezing. Uh, minus 10 in Labrador City, perhaps for the first time tonight, the minus double digits there. So a quiet day tomorrow, increasing clouds uh, across the west coast tomorrow and across western Labrador with some late day snow for you folks pushing into the west. Note your highs tomorrow, six, seven, eight degrees for most of the island, a little bit cooler in places like St. Anthony. And again, that high cloud cover building in for you folks over western parts of Labrador, uh, Newfoundland and for Lab West. Some of those late day flurries starting to push in for you folks. Note the winds a little on the breezy side again for the the north coast of Labrador, everyone else, uh, pretty light winds. Now, as we track into Thursday night and Friday, watch that snow that's been tracking in by Friday morning. Uh, snow on the menu for most with a mix over to by Friday morning, likely Happy Valley Goose Bay and into the Straits in the extreme southeast parts of Labrador. That mix from snow over to some showers. For the island, we will see a few showers into the overnight hours of Thursday night. And then for Friday, a couple of showers possible for Corner Brook, but it's more the Northern Peninsula, Southeastern Labrador, periods of rain with snow continuing on the menu for that coast and back into Western parts of Labrador with temperatures in the low single digits across the rest of the island. It's a mainly cloudy day. We'll see some sun breaks in there, temperatures in the 9, 10, 12 degree range. And so Friday, not looking too, too bad for most of us. Now rolling forward Friday night into Saturday, cold front comes through, some strong winds again, more leaves to be blown off off with this one. Rain to start on Saturday morning for the east, possibly central with some scattered showers over the west. And note that snow, yeah, and that northwest flow. And this is going to be the setup on Saturday. It'll be a warm start on the island. Watch the wind shift through the day. As we move throughout the day, that wind will shift to a little more southwesterly and then even northwesterly. That'll have temperatures falling. So these daytime highs will be Saturday morning. We're all into the mid even low single digits by the end of the day Saturday with uh, some wet flurries mixing in, in the west showers clearing with some sun breaks in the east and yes lingering flurries through Labrador. So uh, quite the uh, roller coaster ride over the next three. Wait till you see the seven day. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. For now we're going to throw it off to Julie Skinner who is down at Bannerman Park. Uh, looks like a party going on there Julie. Uh, uh, what's the latest? To the delight of Halloween enthusiasts everywhere, myself included, this is a very exciting night. That's because Bannerman Park has brought Halloween back for one night. Anyway, the city is asking people to bring down their pumpkins for one last hurrah. To tell me about it, I'm joined by St. John City Councilor Jamie Korab. Hello. Hello, yeah, we're here at Bannerman Park right now for the pumpkin walk. As we light up the loop, we've asked people to come down, wear your costumes, bring your car pumpkins. Everyone that brings them down here gets entered for a prize. We have hot chocolate, and right now there has to be thousands of people here. What an event so far. What a crowd. I can't get over it. Uh, any trouble parking tonight? I had a little trouble parking myself, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, my problem was I had four big pumpkins and only my wife and my daughter, so it was a challenge for us to walk up. Right now, the entire loop, if anyone's ever been here, there's hardly any real estate left to put pumpkins. They're actually going on footpaths now. There's that many pumpkins here. It's great so far. And it's not exclusive to pumpkins. There are turnips as well. I've noticed some turnips, uh, carved turnips, so that was the idea to bring carved ones. But it's great so far. This, As I said, the city has free hot chocolate. Uh, there is a luminescence for all the pumpkins, so we have glow sticks. So they're all lit up. It's like I said, we light up the loop, and so far it's been great. So this is the first year for this event. What was the motivation, the idea behind it? Uh, the city staff is always looking to bring more community events in, to bring community together and create a sense of community. We're a big city of 100,000 people. So with this, 
they have a great amount of pumpkins here, and I'm hoping that this is going to be an annual event because so far this is the first time we've done it. The lineup for cho hot chocolate is huge, but it's moving quickly. It's massive. Yeah, I wonder what the weight is at this point. We were only in line up about five minutes, and the hot chocolate's nice and warm. No complaints there. So uh, this event, I believe, is going on till 8 o'clock? Yeah, it's from 6 to 8, so you got about an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half or so. If you want to come down to Bannerman Park, uh, there's lots of people there, lots of hot chocolate, uh, there's lots of costumes, so you kind of get to really have Halloween again. And the best thing about this event, we're asking people to bring their reusable cups to keep environmentally friendly mine as well. All these pumpkins will be composted. Well, like you said, maybe it's the beginning of an annual event, a pumpkin walk each year. I certainly will push for it because so far, uh, you know, we're, it's only 30 minutes in and it's already a success in my opinion. Okay, well the real question I think on everyone's mind, Jamie Korab, is it possible that all these pumpkins are going to be used to bake some sort of massive delicious pumpkin pie? That can be something maybe for next year, but I can certainly pass that along to the events committee for sure. They look pretty hollow at this point. They are, yes, and a little old, so. Okay, Jamie Korab, thanks so much. My pleasure, thanks. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Julie Skinner at Bannerman Park in St. John's. And it looks like they've got a winner on their hands. And speaking of winners, the 2017 Governor General's Literary Awards were announced this morning. And Newfoundland's own Joel Thomas Hines took home the prize for English fiction. Hines was one of 14 winners out of 70 finalists. The Governor General's Literary Awards are considered the most prestigious literary prizes in the country, with each winner receiving a $25,000 prize. The novelist, screenwriter, director, musician, and actor from Calvert won for his novel, We'll All Be Burnt in Our Beds Some Night. It's described as a portrait of a man's hilarious yet disturbing journey from St. John's to Vancouver. Well, the training camp for the St. John's Edge started today, and it's a first glance at the new bas basketball team in the Basketball League of Canada. The expansion squad will hit the hardwood to kick off their season later this month. As Here Now's Jeremy Eaton reports, the coaches are now trying to finalize the roster. A handful of hoop hopefuls run drills showing off their skills. The hard court of dreams here is cracking the first ever team put on the floor by the St. John's Edge. And this is an opportunity to play professional basketball and, and, and it's going to be difficult. There's no question when it comes time to say, hey, not now or hang on or maybe I'll bring you back or whatever the case may be, uh, that's going to be hard. So pull it out of the net. Okay. Coach Dunlap is tasked with the job of picking the final squad. Among the contenders, St. John's Noel Moffat. I think this might be the best, uh, the best bunch of basketball players I've been around so far. It's uh, very high caliber, a lot of great athletes here, but more importantly, a lot of good basketball players. Among them, Jaron Skeet. So far, I'm just trying to show Coach what I can do, and I'm going to do whatever it takes, to, whatever he needs, and just be a good player, a good teammate, and show the young guys what I learned last year, and also learn from the vets we have on the team. His last name is already grabbing fans' attention. About like two days ago, my phone started blowing up a lot, saying that I always had a bunch of Google alerts popping up about my last name. So my dad Googled it and looked it up, and he told me it's a funny term people use out here. So I'm just going to use it to the best of my ability and basically use that as a promotion. And I'm obviously the opposite of what it means, but I think it's all fun and games. Fun and games off the court, but not on it. I'd be lying if I said there's no pressure. Um, but at the same time, like I got to try to enjoy the moment, you know? You know, this is uh, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so even though there is pressure, I kind of just try to live in the moment and just, you know, soak it in for what it is. Training camp will continue for the next few weeks as Coach Dunlap works to cut the crew of 19 down to 12 for the opening game November 18th. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. The owners of these two famous houses on the island say it's time to sell. We ask the question, what does the future hold for Newfoundland heritage properties?
Welcome back to Here and Now. They are two of the most famous and photographed houses on the island. The Pickersgill properties are in the small outport community of Salvage on the Eastport Peninsula. Now these century old heritage properties are up for sale. But what guarantee is there that a new owner will want to preserve them? We're going to tackle that in just a moment. But first, I'd like you to meet Peter and Lisa, the couple that fell in love with these two old houses 45 years ago. I came here when I was, uh, I was seven years old in 1953. So I was hooked right away and we came back uh, as kids with our parents for uh, years and years. How excited were you when you bought this place back in 1972? Giddy. Giddy, Giddy with delight. Giddy. Absolutely. Yeah, Giddy. when we walked in, it was a real adventure from the get go. Every view out of every window says something and looks onto something different. We love the wind. We love the view of Salvage, watching the comings and goings of the boats. You obviously love the place. How did you come to decide that it was time to, to try to sell them? We're older now. That's why. Lisa, how, how difficult a decision was it? It did take a lot of thought and it took a lot of time to get our minds around it. But finally we said to ourselves, we want to leave this place with good memories not with the burden of, uh, you know, a responsibility that we can't maintain. What aspirations and hopes do you have for whoever buys the place, should somebody buy this place? We have the hope that they will love and shape uh, their, their lives by this place, because that's what happened to us. The uh, kitchen has a plaque that mentions that this is a heritage property. Houses that are over a century old are not everybody's cup of tea, no. as you may know. This is a breathtaking property. What concerns or fears do you have that regardless of the designation of a heritage property that a, a new buyer might say, I'd love to keep them, can't, and just decides to uh, raise them and put something new here, regardless of the heritage designation? Um, I don't know that we can psychologically go there. <laughs> we don't want to go there because yeah. we hope we're going to be talking to people uh, and we'll able, we're able to determine what sort of people they are. And it's quite astonishing when people come here to visit us how giddy with delight they are to be in this place. You chose a rather novel way of selling this place. Can we talk about that? We heard about the fact that there were drones being used uh, to get people to buy real estate. And I thought, this is made for salvage. And uh, when we saw the photos that they took of salvage, we were over the moon. I don't think we need a millionaire, but I think I think there's a, a lot of different kinds of people who would be interested in it. So this is, it's unique, and uh, that's the good and bad news. Uh, people who are uh, not interested will walk away immediately, but many, many people uh, are charmed when they come here. And, uh, you know, and 45 years later, we're charmed. We took a leap in 1972, and um, there are still leapers out there. There are. Come on, leapers. It's obviously a pretty spot and a nice part of the province. Should people in rural Newfoundland worry about protecting our heritage properties? We're going to discuss that now. We've seen bulldozers pulverize old properties here in St. John's. What does heritage really mean? Joining me now is Jerry Dick, the director of the Heritage Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador. Welcome to here now. Thank you. So, Jerry, how many properties, not like this one right here, but the two houses in Salvage, how many properties like that do we have in the province? 
Um, I would say we have hundreds of heritage properties, if not more. In terms of actual properties that are designated, they would number in the hundreds. The foundation has about 340 registered heritage structures, not to mention many municipally designated structures. Right, so the ones in a, in a big place like St. John's, that would fall to the municipality, right? That's right, and there are a number of smaller municipalities in the province that have done designations as well. So when these kinds of properties become available, what does that heritage designation actually mean? How much protection does it give a property like the ones we've seen here tonight? Right, in the case of the Heritage Foundation's uh, designation, it actually is a commemorative thing only, and it's not until we provide restoration funding in the form of a grant that there's then an easement on the property which, which gets registered against the title. In the case of uh, municipally designated properties, I understand, for example, in the city of St. John's, that the city council actually would have to approve any demolition uh, application that might come forward for that property. Right. Ultimately, we need people who are going to care about these buildings if they're going to survive. So a lot of it's really a question of goodwill on the, on the part of the people who acquire these properties. Certainly goodwill. I think there's also a role for municipalities to be proactive. So rather than waiting until someone gets a property, wants to demolish it, we actually plan ahead and we think about some of the properties that might become uh, redundant over the coming years, whether we're talking about historic churches, mm -hmm. government buildings, schools, or some of the larger residential properties, because these seem to be the ones that developers are interested in. Mm -hmm. So if we got a bunch of people together, engaged the public and thought about what's the best and highest use for these properties, and then when, what's the best way to develop it? So in some cases it might be to have the private sector do it, in other cases where there's not a business case, maybe we get uh, social enterprise. So some planning. Do some planning, right. absolutely. But with respect to those two houses, let's say, to be devil's advocate, I'm a wealthy person, deep pockets, and I have a vision of a really ultra-modern penthouse-type structure. I buy the property, raise them, and I just pay back a little bit of money, and I can do pretty much what I want. And I guess that's a tough one. I mean, if someone is really determined to do that, I mean, they can either demolish them or they can also do demolition by neglect, which is something we sometimes see. We've seen so, that here. That's right. So a lot depends on what municipalities, whether they're willing to you know, control these sorts of things and force whatever heritage bylaws they have. Final question for you. We've seen the demolition of these uh, magnificent properties here in St. John's. If a city the size of St. John's has a hard time with these, uh, protecting these kinds of places, what does a little tiny place like Salvage do? Well, I think in some cases, maybe the smaller communities um, have more uh, opportunity because there's probably less development pressure for one, mm -hmm. and they also have a very close eye on what's going on in their community. So right. maybe small, and we've seen some great examples of small communities. Salvage is one where they've done a really good job of preserving the heritage right. they have. Jerry, appreciate you coming on here now tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back to here. Now let's go back to Bellevue for our top story. The suicide of Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend Philip Smith. His body was discovered in the woods near Bellevue Beach, uh, that area early this morning. Now since then there's been a major search underway. We report on that earlier involving police and the rovers. And here now is Megan McCabe is live once again with us this evening with new details. So Megan, what is the latest? Well, the searches have wrapped up for the night. Obviously, it's gotten a bit too dark to search, and they tell me that the brush in, in there in the woods is very, very thick, so it's really hard to find anything anyway. And they also said, uh, well, they can't tell us if they found anything or not, but they're not sure if they're coming back tomorrow. For now, the plan is not to come back here and that the search in this area is done. And these searchers have had a really, really long day. They were first called at midnight last night by the RCMP because Philip Smith had called his family, uh, several members of his family, and said that he planned to end his life. So they then notified police. They knew what area he was in and they came out trying to find him. Those ground searchers were on call from midnight till about 3 a.m not actually here on the site with police saying not sure not sure they had the dogs searching as well and then by 3 a.m they were told they didn't need to come out until today the crews were called back earlier uh, this morning after smith's body was found and the rnc became involved with the search as well because of smith's connection to courtney lake police would not confirm that for us but all they would say that they were searching in connection to an ongoing investigation. But because we know that there is that connection between Smith and Lake, Smith's house had previously been searched um, w shortly around the end of June and there were items that were seized. We know that Smith admitted he picked Courtney up in Mount Pearl on June 7th, which was the last time that Courtney Lake was seen. And we just don't know what has ha what happened after that. We don't know that Smith had anything to do with it either because, of course, no one has been charged in connection with her homicide. So the, uh, some neighbors in the area as well have uh, to uh, came over here and they you know, said this is really unexpected. And they were offering um, home cooked meals and even places to stay to the searchers in case they needed to be camped out here all night. So that's where this search ends and uh, reporting live for here and now, I'm Megan McCabe in Bellevue Beach. It is time now to introduce our young athlete of the day. Jessa Wiseman from Robert's Arm is two and played soccer for the first time over the summer. And Jessa loved playing with her team, the GBS Soccers. That's Soccers, of course, with a K. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Great job, Jessa. You're today's young athlete of the day. All right, uh, weather time. And uh, again, a couple of headlines we're watching over the next couple of days. Snow tracking into Labrador. We've got rain moving into Newfoundland. And the weekend, we'll see some clearing, but certainly some cooling. And the coldest shot of the season coming through the weekend into early next week. And here's how it's going to play out as we back off the satellite and radar picture in terms of what was a pretty quiet day today, thanks to this area of high pressure, which is going to continue to keep things quiet for the most part tomorrow. We are watching this next system moving in from the southwest, and it will be bringing snow to Labrador City by the end of the day tomorrow. And here is the timeline. Again, very quiet tomorrow, mainly sunny skies across across the island and right up through most of Labrador. Note the snow by Thursday evening into Labrador City that will then push across through Labrador for Thursday night and by Friday morning uh, still looking at some snow from Happy Valley Goose Bay up to the north coast down towards Labrador City. But as the warm front lifts northward through the day, we will see periods of rain there. That's uh, also rain on the menu for the northern peninsula with scattered shower chances for the west. A mainly cloudy day for the rest of the island and again a big southerly push of air here ahead of the cold front which will swing through Saturday morning and in behind big push of cool air and yeah we're looking at wet flurries mixing in along the west coast temperatures dropping across the island through the day on Saturday and that cold air will be moving in uh, at a pretty good pace and so the next three in case you missed it again uh, we are looking at Again, pretty quiet couple of days for most of the island and note those temperatures on Saturday into the double digits low teens, but that's to start the day and we're certainly into the single digits by the time we get to the end of the day on Saturday and across uh, into the long range setup. The nice area of high pressure moves back in for Sunday 
but that's a cool air mass still in place. So winds in from the west northwest as we roll into the early stages of next week. However, another warm up and a big southerly push of air. We've got this system moving in with uh, rain for Labrador and then eventually into Newfoundland for Tuesday. And so that seven day trend, we rise, we fall for Sunday and then arise again for Monday into Tuesday of next week where we're talking about double digits and teens on the menu back into the single digits by late next week and across into Labrador again, a big cool down. Look at those highs in the minus six range through the weekend in Lab West. So uh, cold old man winter really pushing in hard with this next shot. Okay, speaking of shots, our weather picture of the day. Any guesses? We'll let you soak this one in and uh, we'll reveal where this picture was taken after the break. Okay, so before the break, we showed you another beautiful weather Indeed. picture. Uh, yeah. Any guesses? Humber just, Valley. Yeah, I was thinking it might be out towards the west coast. Certainly not on the Avalon with trees that big. No, that's true. And uh, great guess there. West coast and actually right in Cornerbrook is oh. where this picture was taken. And this is an interesting one because this picture was taken on Monday. And then, of course, we had the big wind system come through. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, this is, the, uh, by the way, Valerie took the pictures. I'll give uh, Valerie a nice big shout out. Thanks for the pictures. And then she sent oh, this. Oh, oh, dear. One day later, we oh. talked about the fact that, uh, you know, it's been so dry that how are these going to trees, trees going to hold up? Well, not so well. Yeah. Oh, it's sad. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And Valerie obviously owns a rake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or they're, or they're all in port of basque <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yeah. up in Bay Verde. Uh, and by the way, speaking of uh, dry and warmer than normal, which October was, uh, Rodney Barney uh, from the Gander Weather Office has posted all those stats. I uh, posted them on my Facebook page, they're on my blog. Some pretty crazy numbers from October. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you can check them out there. We've all been commenting, yep. it has been unusual. Well, that is it for us. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Yep. Good night. Happy raking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.